Hi, and welcome back to TPI's podcast, To Think Minimum. It's Tuesday, February 26th, 2019. I'm Scott Walston, President and Senior Fellow of the Technology Policy Institute. Today, we're excited to talk with Maureen Olhausen and Alan Rawl. Maureen is currently practice group chair and partner of antitrust and competition law at Baker Botts in Washington, D.C. Before that, she served as acting chairman and commissioner of the Federal Trade Commission, where she directed all aspects of the agency's antitrust activities, from merger review and conduct enforcement to consumer protection enforcement to policy formulation on privacy and technology issues. Alan Rawl is founder and lead partner of Sidley Austin's privacy and cybersecurity practice in Washington, D.C. He represents companies on privacy and cybersecurity issues, including global protection and compliance issues, data breaches, consumer protection issues, and internet law before the FTC, State Attorneys General, SEC, Department of Justice, and other government agencies. And I'm joined today by Tom Leonard, a Senior Fellow and President Emeritus of TPI. So welcome, Rain and Alan. We last saw you on a privacy panel we hosted at the National Press Club on January 16th, earlier this year. It's now late February 2019, and this week the Senate is holding hearings on federal data privacy. So I wanted to start with a big question. Will there be privacy legislation this year? Well, (laughs) Scott, that's a very good question. I would say in my assessment, so I've been in this business for quite a while, and I would say it's the best chances that I've seen during my time. In the 100th and 11th Congress was a lot of debate about privacy bills, and several bills were floated, but then that sort of fell, fell away. There's been interest in data security legislation, but again, nothing had passed. So I think there's a lot of energy behind doing something in this space, both on data security and privacy, a lot of it being driven by what's happened in Europe with the GDPR and the California privacy legislation as well. But whether it will actually get across the finish line is still the big question. I agree with uh, Maureen. More energy than ever, best chance ever. But uh, if what you're talking about is federal privacy legislation, which being the kind of nitpicky lawyer that I am, mm-hmm. I noticed you <laughs> elided the federal there. You know, Maureen mentioned California. Of course, Europe. Other states are chomping at the bit to get into the action. Washington state, perhaps leading the charge. Others interested as well. So uh, there's certainly momentum around the country and around the world. This is probably the most... Uh, you know, auspicious environment if one favors federal privacy legislation, but, you know, there the devil will be in the details there and uh, preemption, which I'm sure we'll get to, uh, no doubt influence whether it uh, gets across uh, the barrier or not. Not everyone knows that we do have some general privacy laws in this country yes. that are administered and enforced by the FTC. So, Maureen, maybe you can just take a minute or two and explain what it is the FTC does and what the FTC's approach is in enforcing privacy. So, Tom, thanks for asking that, because I think that has gotten a little bit lost in the debate and gets a little underappreciated. So, the FTC is the General Consumer Protection Agency in the U.S., and under its organic statute, the FTC Act, it can prevent deceptive and unfair practices. And so, it has used its deception authority when companies have made promises about what data they would collect or how they would safeguard it or with whom they would share it and then didn't live up to those promises. And so there's been quite a bit of enforcement in that space. And then on the unfairness prong of the FTC's authority, they've used that quite effectively to say if a company has used data in a way that even it didn't make a promise, but where it causes a substantial injury to consumers, it can bring an enforcement action. And in the data security area, it's that authority where it's it's relied on for bringing challenges about companies not taking reasonable precautions to secure and protect data. So where there have been big data breaches or hacks, Uh, where a company hasn't taken reasonable precautions, the FTC has acted in that space. And of course, we're we're focused a lot on online issues, but privacy is much broader than that. You think back to the Fair Credit Reporting Act that has a lot of privacy elements in it. The FTC enforces that, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. There's health information privacy, which HHS enforces. But the FTC has brought more than 500 privacy and data security cases, both online and offline, through this very general authority that it has. So there's the question of, does it need more tools? Does it need more resources? But it has used the sort of general authority it's been given fairly effectively and at times aggressively in the privacy space. So do you think, does it need more tools and or more resources? Well, I think it's being asked to do more things right now, right? There is this big concern about Do consumers have control over their data? Is this a competition issue? So I think more resources might be of use, not endless amounts of resources, but 
that's you know, maybe a little bit more. As for more tools, one of the questions is, is the remedial authority that the FTC has sufficient? So in uh, previous iterations of data security and breach notification law, the FTC has been in favor of getting civil penalty authority. Right. So right now, the FTC can get um, redress for consumers. So if you can say there was a harm to consumers um, and uh, you can identify you know, the amount of money they were harmed, the FTC could get that money back, but it couldn't penalize companies unless they violated either an order that was already in place or a rule that had already been authorized, like the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. So one of the issues for data security is, do companies have the right incentives to protect data sufficiently? And would giving civil penalty authority to the FTC allow it to you know, encourage companies to take those kind of precautions? Because in data security, when sensitive data gets exposed, consumers might suffer things like fraud and identity theft, but it can be very hard to trace back that to any particular data breach because there have been a lot you know of breaches that expose people's social security numbers and account numbers so so drawing that line between the harm and the breach is difficult so that's why in previous uh, commissions they've been supported myself included in giving the FTC civil penalty authority for data breach now the question about privacy that's a little I think more more challenging yeah, I think that uh, the question of whether the FTC can uh, seek a penalty in the first instance without, as Maureen speaks, without there having been a consent order in place or a specific rule that was violated, that's very much in play right now. And I think that uh, whereas several years ago, uh, perhaps uh, you would have seen the business community oppose that uh, adamantly, I think that there's greater flexibility now whether uh, the FTC could seek in appropriate cases with uh, sufficient showing a penalty in the first instance uh, without having to wait for, uh, let's say, a decree to have been ostensibly uh, violated. And I think that there are a number of problems with the existing consent decrees that the FTC has entered into. It's understandable that uh, companies uh, seek to settle when the array of the federal government is uh, is mounted against them, just as companies settle in civil litigation in, in other contexts. But oftentimes, what has happened is that in order to avoid, um, you know, continued to investigations, companies settle and end up being subject to a FTC consent decree for 20 years. And that has been a de facto, you know, sort of Damocles over many companies, tech companies that in 20 years, you know, may not exist or certainly not uh, be recognizable. So I think there could be considerable reform of the consent decree process. And, you know, as part of that, perhaps, uh, you know, civil uh, penalty authority in the first instance is something uh, to be considered. With regard to the incentives that Maureen mentioned, especially with data breaches, data security, I honestly think that uh, companies have a tremendous incentives to protect uh, their information. That's not to say they do it perfectly or that they do it reliably. And I do think that the FTC has done a really very admirable job of trying to avoid gotcha cases, as they would put it, but but rather go after more serious violations. But today, with the plaintiff's bar being so aggressive and bringing cases on data breaches, when there's the Securities and Exchange Commission that is also in the mix for sanctioning egregious uh, data breach violations that have not been disclosed by public companies appropriately, where shareholders have filed suit, where there have been derivative actions. I think there's an awful lot of incentive to protect this data. And I think companies generally do, they try quite hard, whether they do quite well, that's a function of the risk that they face, just as the federal government and government agencies, including the FTC and uh, including a lot of the intelligence community, they've experienced breaches. So this is a subject that I think it may be remedied, may be enhanced, not so much by incentivizing enforcement, but rather by federal government taking additional steps to protect us all from hackers. It's interesting the way you framed this, because opponents of a GDPR-style solution say that the FTC, uh, the status quo is too weak. Um, and Alan, you were basically describing it as too strong, Yeah, um, that companies get stuck with consent decrees that last for too long, it might be too harsh. How do you square that? I mean, but they're saying that the FTC is too weak, and that's why we need reforms, and you're saying it's too strong? I don't really think that, at least not in uh, candid uh, sidebar conversations, conversations with European officials that they would say that the FTC is too weak. I think they view the FTC as a role model and as an agency whose enforcement uh, authorities, whose enforcement prowess, whose enforcement activities, they want to emulate. 
I think that they would like to really transform themselves. And by they, I'm talking about the European Data Protection Authorities that enforce the the GDPR. They'd like to be the FTC on steroids. And now that they have up to 4% of annual revenue uh, penalty authority, they view that as the cudgel that will uh, convert them into... uh, you know, FTC-like agencies. What the FTC has, though, with regard to the Section 5 authority that Maureen talked about as kind of the general privacy and data security enforcement, is really a statute that allows the FTC to go after abuses, real abuses, where, you know, a private actor has acted uh, egregiously to impose some harm on on individuals. And for the most part, I think the FTC is sensitive to acting on the basis of harm and abuse, although we can talk a little bit more about that later. Under the GDPR and the Europeans, they don't quite accept the model that what should be sanctioned, what should be disciplined, what should be enforced against is when a private organization, you know, does something wrong that causes harm or injury to citizens or consumers. And instead, you get a GDPR model that is infinite in its opportunities for violation with now a a sanctioning authority of 4% that, you know, is draconian. There's so many ways you can violate it. They don't worry about harm and injury that much. And they have, you know, phenomenal sums that they can pose as penalties. So that's going to be a pretty dangerous environment. So speaking of FCD with the Europeans, I mean, now in the U.S., the Federal Trade Commission, I don't know how much either of you can talk about this, but the FTC is now investigating Facebook for violation of the consent decree that it's uh, that it is under now. And one believes the press, they're talking about potentially multi-billion or multi-billion dollar fines, much, much larger, as far as I know, that have ever been imposed by the FTC before. Do you think somehow the FTC feels pressure from what the Europeans are doing, and that's why they're talking about such large numbers? I'm going to speak only generally of it and not comment on the specifics of the case, but do I think that the Federal Trade Commission and other arms of both the federal and state governments are under some pressure to take actions in the privacy sphere? I think the answer to that would be, yeah, of course. Privacy issues have captured the public's attention, and I'll say even in America recently, such that, you know, the zeitgeist has changed. Whereas previously, I think one could uh, fairly and reasonably say that uh, Americans were fairly, you know, copacetic about uh, sharing information and uses of information. You know, things started to change first in Europe, I think, with the Snowden revelations, even though that didn't involve commercial privacy at all, rather uh, intelligence community. You know, I think the recent credit bureau data breach with uh, affected, uh, you know, just about all of the country where conceitedly by the victim company there, very sensitive data, passport information was included. I think that people start thinking about that. But then, in my view, another non-commercial development is what changed the public psychology, and that's the manipulation of uh, the election by the Russians. And doing so in our social media networks, based on information that we share with each other and with our, you know, social media, and they were able to apparently very effectively with the expenditure, I'm not sure how much money was at stake, but I'm sure it was more in the sophistication than in the dollars. But I think when people realize that their information can be put to manipulative uses that have consequences about what they believe and maybe how they vote, I think that's troubling. So I think that the sensibilities have changed in the political marketplace, if you will. So yeah, is there pressure? I would think so. But to go to your point, Tom, about if they were talking multi-billion instead of, I think, 22 and a half million was the largest ever before. And the French Data Protection Authority, known by its a- French acronym, the CNIL, just imposed, you know, I think the largest fine in Europe, which was 50 million euros, about $57 million. So if we ratchet it up, if somebody ratchets it up to the billions, that would be, uh, you know, quite a leap. So it's interesting, and I think you're right, that all these issues are kind of conflated together in the public mind. Those of us who work in privacy, to some extent, kind of try to cabin off the issue, the the issue of the use of, of private data for commercial purposes and targeted advertising and all of that. But it's all been conflated together with election meddling and national security issues, which are really are really different issues. They're really all different issues. Do you think it's appropriate to conflate them together or just it just happened and that's what, that's what politics is? You know? Well, I think the Europeans conflated them, if you will, because the data protection authorities in Europe, which don't have authority over national security, basically took out the perceived excesses you know, that were leaked by Snowden and took it out on the U.S. tech companies. You know, how convenient that the European enforcers go after U.S. companies based on national security, perceived national security activities that you know really 
benefited not only the United States, but in many ways, Europe uh, as well. I think that the conflation really arises again because of the odd jurisdictional organization of Europe. I'm not odd, but, but rather the, you know, the commercial privacy regulators, they are really taking action based on their concerns over national security issues. But if you look at where the problem, you know, the problems really are, and I want to take the opportunity to praise Maureen in her tenure as acting a chair at the FTC and barking on an informational injuries workshop and, you know, study of what is and ought to be an actionable injury to enforce in the privacy realm. And it's not easy to say. Now, if your identity or your money has been stolen, you know, no doubt about it. That's really injurious. And if your you know, voting interests and your beliefs have been manipulated concretely, that I would say is certainly actionable on a, on a social level. But I was listening this morning to the House hearing on privacy, which was very interesting, and the testimony was very illuminating and erudite. But the one thing that is missing from testimony about privacy legislation is what are the problems? And I think we really need to think about that. You know, if you go to a hearing at, uh, involving Food and Drug Administration, they tell you about the problems. The problems are that people are going to get sick or that medicine is not being approved enough to prevent people from getting sick. You go to a, you know, an environmental hearing, people are exposed to toxins and pollutants, and this could have an impact on their, you know, and you might debate the extent of the injury, but you know what the injuries are. I listened to the entire hearing this morning, and there was very little discussion of problems other than identity theft. And, you know, what I'll, you know, call that the Cambridge Analytica election interference. And I say that as a real believer in that privacy is important because personal autonomy and dignity, it really counts. And uh, people should not have their expectations, you know, just uh, rejected or ignored. And that's important. But we really ought to take a hard look at what is injurious, what is harmful, what is actionable, and regulation ought to be based on that. I would submit that the Europeans don't do that. I think the FTC has done a pretty good job of focusing on harms. Thank you, Alan, for that compliment, because I do think that is important. What is the problem we're trying to solve for here? Now, there's this bigger tech backlash going on, and privacy has become part of that. Uh, there's a reaction against American companies around the world. There's a reaction against companies just being big and seen as powerful. And, you know, this critiques about privacy, I think, is part of this larger issue. And then there is the issue that I think a subtext in this that doesn't get surfaced as much, but should, is that there's a big fight going on about advertising dollars. Tech companies and the tech platforms, they have captured a lot of the advertising dollars that used to go to different traditional newspapers, traditional media, and so I think that is also driving some of the critiques here. I mean, not totally. I think there have been privacy issues and privacy concerns, but I think we need to look at it as part of this bigger issue. And, you know, one of the things that really struck me, Alan, you mentioned the Keneal decision against Google, is the fact that if you have a detailed statute, if you have this idea that it, you know, here is what consent is a notice is supposed to look like, why don't you put out some guidance first, right? Why don't you say, you know, here's this very detailed statute. In some ways, a GDPR regulation, in some ways it's detailed, but it doesn't give all that much guidance, I think. And if what you're trying to focus on is giving consumers more control rather than got you enforcement, maybe you should give the companies a little better idea of what you think is sufficient notice, what you think is a sufficient legitimate interest, because that's another issue that, you know, with this enormous fine possibly hanging over the heads of companies for, you know, essentially not being able to discern, well, what does this particular, you know, DPA think, you know, too many clicks through to get to the all the information or what's not clear enough. So that was one thing that that kind of jumped out at me. Maybe there should be a little more guidance here if what we're actually trying to do is to make sure consumers have the tools that they want for controlling. Our the FTC have to do something like that when trying to define deception and unfairness, give companies guidance of what exactly those So the be. FTC did do that, mm -hmm. right? Because there had been big debates previously about the FTC's deception 
and, and unfairness authority. And they were quite, you know, the political issue of their day. And so the FTC adopted a deception policy statement and then an unfairness policy statement, which Congress eventually codified. So for unfairness, rather than saying, oh, it just means something that some regulator or three regulators don't like, by statute, it has to be an act or practice that causes substantial injury to the consumer that the consumer can't reasonably avoid and that's not outweighed by countervailing benefits to competition or to consumers. And so in the policy statement, the FTC tried to give a little more substance to what those types of injuries would be. And that is one of the reasons why, you know, I did the informational injury workshop at the FTC because Mm -hmm. I thought it was important to understand what is a substantial injury. I think it's fairly well established and most people would agree, you know, you you lose money. Yes, we think losing money is (laughs) an injury. But where else did it go? I think that having your sensitive medical information exposed on the internet or not on the internet, but exposed, (laughs) whether internet or not on the internet, would qualify as a substantial injury. And I think the fact that we have HIPAA suggests that Congress would agree, most people would agree. I brought a case against a revenge porn website to say, you know, exposing those kind of intimate photos, I think most people would agree was an injury, but it's not a money injury. Mm -hmm. And so I think, but I wouldn't necessarily agree, whereas the Europeans might think this, that I get to control what everyone thinks of me, or people can't say, you know, Maureen Olhausen has, you know, blue eyes and is five foot two, unless I allow people to reveal that about. So I think I thought you were like six four. There I am, six four. Yeah. But but I think that you know it's not an endless amount. Like well, just because one person feels I don't you know I don't want someone to know that. So that it's hard to draw the line. But I think it's important that we we at least try. So notwithstanding everything you all are saying, a lot of the, I think many of the proponents of privacy legislation in this country are looking to the Europeans and to California as as a model. What do you all think would be would be the effects of that? I mean, would, would we lose our competitive advantage? Would it be? So one of my concerns, there are among several concerns, I think it's interesting that in Europe they were really pushing towards having a single a, the digital single market. Right, that they had, you know, the the European Union is the attempt to combine all these separate economies to get the benefits of the kind of unified economy we've enjoyed in in the US. And the data protection regulation, the GDPR, was supposed to be part of this bigger push to have a more uniform approach. I would be concerned in the US if we start sort of breaking apart our unified market, ironically, kind of in reaction to the GDPR. So I think that's one concern. One of the other things that I would point to, so just last week, I reread the FTC's data broker report. One thing that, you know, that report identifies is the protections that are already in place, Fair Credit Reporting Act and and other, you know, types of anti-discrimination statutes also identifies the benefits to consumers from data from the ability of companies to access data and to advertise to them or to create new products and and things like that. So I think, you know, we need to be careful about that. There may be changes we need to do, you know, at the margin, but I would be concerned about doing that without also being cautious about losing the benefits our economy has enjoyed and consumers have enjoyed by having a uniform standard and having the ability for companies to use data to innovate. You know, Tom, I think that you're, uh, you asked about what impacts would it have if we do emulate the EU's GDPR over here, which I think seems to be the direction that we're going. Certainly California and Alistair McTaggart, the gentleman whose ballot initiative is what ultimately resulted in the California Consumer Privacy Act, CCPA. He was trying to emulate the EU. The Washington state legislation consciously seeks to emulate at hearings before. Since September, there have been hearings where basically uh, members of Congress on both sides of the aisle have talked about EU-based models with the rights that it it grants. So there is a likelihood, and I'll say a danger of moving in that direction, which is, in my view, overly bureaucratized and the development of too many different hurdles, not all of which, many of which, most of which are not commensurate with the benefits they provide to anyone. I will say, and to give the, the EU and the GDPR its due, the focus on 
transparency and disclosing what the practices of companies are, I think actually is a positive thing. If you ask me, what do I think the real problem in the privacy sphere is, as opposed to cybersecurity, it's that really people don't understand what's going on. And that if there were more transparency, yes, there were some practices that probably would be disincentivized through greater disclosure and general knowledge. But people are, I think, largely comfortable with a lot of the commercial practices and the commercial uses of data, but they're really not all that knowledgeable. And there's especially in the internet ecosystem, a lot of companies that nobody knows anything about. And, you know, I think it might be fair to say that not only do consumers not know, you know, what, really what is going on with the advertising uh, ecosystem, I would say that's also true of a lot of companies. Sometimes a uh, development uh, erupts into the media. It turns out that really nobody understood what was going on. I think there ought to be better understanding, but fewer rules, more focus on disclosures, let the marketplace decide whether they are or they're not comfortable, but maybe bring some of the companies out of the shadows. And to go to Maureen's point about guidance, maybe provide some more guidance so that it's not just about catching people and the, you know, the gotcha thing. Just very recently, what has been styled as a CCPA fix bill was introduced by a California state senator together with the support of the attorney general, Xavier Becerra. And one of the fixes. This is not a fix that industry or companies would like. These are not fixes that they would like. But one of the fixes that the attorney general, you know, insisted on was that he not be obligated to provide guidance to companies who want to comply. He said, he's quoted, I I read this uh, just recently, quoted as saying, I don't give free legal advice to companies. But the original bill said, give guidance to companies so that they can comply. I think that attitude of of really trying to hide the ball is not good for anybody. And it it can result in uh, excessive uh, enforcement, unwarranted enforcement. And if compliance is the objective, uh, make it easier. Speaking of transparency, one aspect of this is the notices. And we do know that almost all consumers just don't read the notices, even if they were were better written and more clearly written. Unclear how much that would change. But do you think companies themselves just in their, in their in the way they approach these issues, public or derelict, and not explaining better how they use data, that they're, they, they do have a business model, some of them, which is based on monetizing data. That's not an evil thing. There are many benefits that flow from that. But they kind of act like, Jesus, you caught us. We're actually making money off this data. You know? I mean, do you think... You think it's body? Do you think they could explain it better? I and mean, maybe they're kind of reaping the costs of never having explained it? I think that, you know, it would be wise for them to make a little more of the case for the benefits of data availability and data usage in innovation and in competition and, you know, how much advertising supported content and services consumers are enjoying, right? And, and I think consumers can understand some of that trade-off and make perhaps making it a little more explicit would be useful. I do think one of the challenges for the California law is saying, well, you, consumers can opt out of that, but you still have to give them the same service. You know, I don't know how that's going to work, how that's going to work. But I do think that it could be beneficial if they if they were a little clearer about that. And I also agree with Alan that, you know, the GDPR is not all bad. I mean, you know, certainly it has some very good provisions in it and more transparency might be beneficial. But I think that, you know, kind of just going back to your guidance point, one of the things that I really liked about the, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act is the fact that it permits companies to come up, it can be an organization, it could be, you know, a trade association, or it could be like a consumer group or or something to come up with a program for getting consent for the collection of children's data and getting the parental consent. And then the FTC reviews it, and then they get a safe harbor if they comply with that. So I think that's one of the things that should be explored if we are considering a general privacy law. Because that's the other thing that I is a little concerning to me is we're talking about this in terms of, you know, big online platforms, but a general privacy law is going to affect economy wide, industry wide. There's all different ways and interfaces that consumers experience and ways data is collected and used and shared. And to kind of come up with a a clear one size fits all with a big, you know, penalty hanging over the head of a company if they don't get it right, again, I, I think perhaps 
something that gives a little more guidance to companies, whether it's through this kind of COPPA-like safe harbor approach. Even the GDPR talks about codes of conduct. I think there's some interesting thinking to be done in that space. Also, I thought um, you made this point at our January conference, which might be obvious to legal people who follow this, but that a company violating its own terms of service is by definition a harm, right? Yes, um, it is. So, right. th- I mean, these sort of rules that you're talking about, you can't come up with practices and then not follow them. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that's a great point, Scott. And I did want to say that while privacy policies have been much maligned and, you know, the notice and choice model, but I don't think we should sell them short. One, for the very point that you make, that companies are self-governed by their privacy policies. If they don't comply with them, they can get in trouble. It would be deception, surely, from the, the FTC, although I would argue that there still would need to be substantial injury, perhaps, but we can talk about that, you know, some other time. But I can say from representing companies that the amount of time they spend both drafting their privacy policies and then seeking to adhere to them and internally analyzing and defending internally and justifying any changes from their privacy policy or change, at least many companies take them very seriously internally. Now, while it's true that rare is the consumer who will read a privacy policy, you know, that's also true about securities filings under the SEC laws, right? And I think people believe that that regime works pretty well. Why? Because there are experts who pour over them, read them very closely, and then disseminate the information to the marketplace. So there are advocates who read, privacy advocates, who read these policies very closely and are acutely sensitive to any changes in these policies and that there is a blogosphere out there that picks up on these things very quickly. So I think it would be erroneous to conclude that just because consumers don't, each consumer doesn't read it before taking some action, that they're not governing the companies both internally and through uh, FTC or state attorney general discipline or by contractual or other legal action against them, but also just self-governance. Most companies are legitimate, take these things pretty seriously, and they don't just slap out a policy and not comply. I'm not suggesting, uh, I don't want to be, you know, Pollyannish here, but big companies take these things seriously, the ones who get, you know, the most data, at least in my experience, they're trying hard to comply with them. They take them seriously. Actually, I haven't been watching the clock, but a couple more things if we have time that, I, that I'd like to kind of touch on that, that are among the two most, con- among the more, more controversial aspects of people are talking about in the context of a new part of privacy law. One is uh, preemption of states, and the other is, I just noticed to talk about California, just you know, today was reading the California Attorney General was going to expand the, the California law to include a private right of action. And of course, those two things are both been talked about in the federal context as well. You want to kind of give us your, your take on those two things? Well, you know, on preemption, I think it's uh, always uh, been one of the, the factors that uh, one imagines is, is in a trade-off or compromise on legislation between, you know, the, the legislators who are more inclined to, toward the business community and those who are more inclined to the uh, advocacy or consumer protection uh, community. With regard to preemption of, you know, state law in the privacy realm, this is inherently digital. Well, Maureen is certainly right and mentioned a couple of times that privacy legislation and policy doesn't just affect the large internet companies and platforms. But nonetheless, this is very much of a digital issue. You know, the information age is less territorial, less geographically finite than uh, the prior commercial uh, ages. So if ever there were a field where you would think that uh, you know, national standards should govern, it's where you know, digital information that travels you know, uh, everywhere and is, is everywhere at the same time. So it does seem like it's naturally an area where a, a federal standard or national standard should prevail over individual state standards. We've seen in the data breach context with 50 state laws, plus you know, D.C. and Puerto Rico, Guam and Virgin Islands and so on, that the proliferation of those standards has not contributed to data security. Rather, it's contributed to uncertainty. It's contributed to bureaucratic uh, administrative burdens, legal time. Thank you. We appreciate that. (laughs) But it's really not added substantively at all to consumer protection. That problem would be even worse with privacy. I'm sure this is true for Marine as well, but I'm working with a lot of companies on California compliance because even though it's not in effect till 2020, they're starting to get ready. And, you know, the notion that one state 
if it's as large as California, could set what will be de facto national standards. You know, that's not appropriate either. So I think preemption has got to be part of the equation. I can't imagine that there's ultimately a compromise that prevails without there being, you know, significant preemption. I mean, the trade off will be maybe stronger standards. Uh, but, you know, I would commend all of us to, uh, in addition to, to Maureen's very excellent informational injuries workshop and uh, addressing that, but also to the administration's request for comments that they put out with the NTIA at the Commerce Department looking for new privacy framework. There is a better way to do this. I think that the administration's uh, request for comments is very sound. It really focuses on uh, cost-benefit type analysis, taking privacy seriously as a uh, a social good, but nonetheless, one that should be balanced against the impacts on innovation and prosperity. You know, it's not just rules-based, it's outcomes-based. Are we really protecting people? Or are we just layering on more rules? I could talk about private right of action too, but uh, right. I'm sure Maureen yes. is interested in speaking about it as well. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree uh, with what Alan said. And I, I do think we need to keep in mind, we want privacy and prosperity. And we, we, both values are important to American uh, and consumers. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I often like to look at you know what has worked okay in the past, and when you, you're talking about preemption, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's no role for the states. So if you think about again the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, the state AGs can enforce that, but they enforce it at the federal standard. Right. So you get some of the benefits of having the local involvement if there's something that's, you know, more of a local kind of impact or, you know, even a broader impact, but the benefits of a uniform approach. The private right of action, you know, certainly concerns about will this, you know, just lead to class action lawsuits that the FTC has weighed in on various class actions where it doesn't seem to be serving the uh, consumer interest very well and may be more in the interest of the lawyers. So uh, as is having... 50 different breach notification laws, because if you ever tried to do one of those, which I had to do recently for a client, you know, you're you saying, well, okay, there's this state and there's this state and there's this state and okay, whose data was affected? Well, now we add on this state and now, and you know, you might say, well, you, you pick the most sort of rigorous state and comply w- with that. But there are some states that say, well, first you have to tell our state police forensics unit before you tell consumers, and then it's like, well, what if there's another state that says, no, you have to tell the consumers? <laughs> I mean, you can start to, to get into some real conundrums there. And, and I, don't, I don't think that that's making consumers any better off to have that type of a balkanized approach in privacy. So I think probably with that, we should leave it there. This issue isn't going away, and we can keep talking about it for a long time, and I'm sure we will. And thank you both very much for being on this podcast, and we look forward to doing it again sometime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.